you really want to know the background of how it came to be. You, you've got a rough idea because they tell you, we're going, going over there to, to help the Thais protect their country and, and so on and so forth. You do your job as a fiery. If anything happens, you go and rescue the pilot and away you go. Um, now, what, and, are you, what are you protecting the Thais from? Um, from um, incursions from um, the east, protecting their borders. So from um, insurgents from, in Laos and from, Cambodia? From incursions from the, from the east, both Laos, Cambodia. Or uh, now, for what um, what the sabers were doing were, were, um, were was um, um, they were basically doing border patrols. So if anything happened, or if 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 um, if, if Lion Control, which was the radar of the USAF control, um, um, saw something coming, they would contact the the uh, the RAF RAF uh, seventy nine squadron, and away they'd go, and they'd try to find the incursion which they never ever did now in the time you're there yeah in the time i was there and now the huh. rules of engagement didn't really affect me as a fiery um it really only affected the pilots and and the one that that was most laughed at um do not fire until fired upon you know so <laughs> So, yeah. uh, well, so let me, so now you're, you're referring to yourself as a fiery, is that right? That's correct. Yes. So I think here where our English isn't as good, we would say fireman or something like that. So, well, okay. <laughs> fiery is a colloquial term for firefighter, fireman, whatever. All right. Okay. And then, so, and then you, you referred to the Sabres. The, these are the fighter jets. They're the, they're the fighter jets. The F-86. Yeah. Um, they, uh, they were a, um, a, an, an Australian adaption of the F-86 um, in that they had um, um, Rolls-Royce Avon engines installed and two 30 millimeter Aden cannons installed. And the basic premise is, is, is that for the rules of engagement is that um, this is what you can, well, you know, any military man says, this is, what you can do, this is what you can do and this is what you can't do. And don't you dare go outside those rules of engagement. Um, and as I was saying, that the basic premise was um, the Sabres would go out every morning at about um, half past eight, two of them, um, and um, they'd go wherever they went. I have no idea where they went, but to my understanding, they patrolled the border between Cambodia, Laos, and, um, and Thailand. And, and, um, and Thailand. And they were out for about um, uh, three and a half hours. And so the, the mission is to protect Thailand from incursions. And here, let's just get the, get the chronology here. Uh, when did yep. you arrive in Thailand? July, uh, 25th of July, 1964 through till 25th of January, 1965. Okay, so, so 64, 65. Yes. And the mission is to protect Thailand from incursions from yes. the east. What? Yes. Who? Who? Who would launch incursions into Thailand um, from Cambodia or Laos? The 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 Australians went there um, in response to an invitation from the King of Thailand, um, um, because. The consideration was there was a threat from both Laos and Cambodia, both ground uh, and that, that in communist forces, that is, both ground and potentially air um, resources. Um, now, whether it was a real threat from air resources, I can't answer that. I don't know. Um, so... Um, um, but that was that was the principle. This was, I mean, related then obviously to um, a concern of, about the the spread of communism. Communism, that's correct. Now, when you when you leave Thailand, yes. the Vietnam War is, you know, really just starting to heat up. Really beginning to heat up. It was, it wasn't okay. 
The best way to describe it for, um, from my perspective um, was that you could see that, the, um, that America was preparing for something major um, by the amount of construction that was going on uh, at Ubon. Now, uh, the whole six months that I was there, there was a con constant flow of concrete trucks um, preparing a hard stand to the, to the town side of where the fire station was. Uh, and that eventually became the hard stand for the F-4 Phantoms and the um, B-57s and whatever aircraft they had. So, um, and um, it, the hard stand wasn't that big um, when we were there, um, when I was there. It only extended past the, the tower by 50 meters. So you could tell your whole time there, you just had a sense that you know, something was building just because yes. the American presence was becoming greater and greater at Ubon where you yes. were? Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Now you're there in Thailand and yep. these missions are being flown along the border to prevent yep. incursions into Thailand. Yep. Communist incursions on the ground from Cambodia and Laos. Um, to what extent were you aware at the time that there was also a problem brewing in Vietnam. For oh, other very, countries. very, very, very aware. You were very aware, aware. Of that too. Very aware. Yep. I personally was very well aware of what was going on, and um, and and there was a reasonable amount of press um, about the Vietnam because Australia had already sent um, a battalion of um, of of army to the to um, to Vietnam, and they they were at Noi Dat, um, in just um, in the Phuc Thuy province, um, and the RAF had a presence at Vang Tau um, as well. Now, at about 60, 62, 63, Australia had bought caribous um, from um, Canada, and the, the the they were diverted from flying to Australia to flying straight to Vietnam as a, as a light transport um, wow. supply, and that was um, that was uh, thirty five squadron, thirty five or thirty eight squadron. So they they were diverted straight to to Vietnam, and there were eight of them, I think, that went to Vietnam straight up. They didn't come to Australia. So Australia uh, purchased those in Canada, and then they flew yep. straight to Vietnam. Straight to Vietnam, yes. And is this happening in the the same time you're in Thailand? About the uh, roughly the same time frame. Oh, yes. So again, pretty. Yeah, it might have been a little bit after that. It might have been a little bit after that. After that, um, uh, but somewhere about 64, 65. But that's easy enough to find out where exactly the the they um they went there just by looking it up on the net. So, sure. Now, from the American perspective, you are um, doing military work in Southeast Asia yep. pretty early. Of course, most Americans, yes. you know, we don't have a significant number of combat troops in Vietnam until 65. I think, that, that's you're, you're, I think you're already home by the time yeah. you know, the Marines yeah. landed. That's right. Well, the, the American Air Force, uh, the first F-4s arrived in, um, in Ubon in April 1965. Around the same time then as the, as yes, the, as yes, the Marines yes, at, at the yeah. So you're, you're injured playing soccer, or as yep. you call it in Australia, football, I think. Yes, so you're yeah, injured, football, soccer. And, and then so you go to, for some medical treatment, you go to a British base in Malaysia. And you're yep. not, you're not in Malaysia a long time, but, but the reason that caught my attention when I read that is because when we, we meaning I'm thinking of the United States, when the United States yes. gets into Vietnam, understanding yes. what kind of war it is, and we, yes. and we ask questions, you know, like, can we win this kind of war? I think yes. part, part of that discussion earlier, early on, 
is that well the British faced something like this in Malaysia. They, they certainly did a war similar to this yes. in Malaysia, and the British succeeded. Um, they certainly in did Malaysia. And so if the British yeah. can succeed in Malaysia, then we can succeed in 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 South Vietnam. Um, yep. Now I think you know it, it, I think it's it's a lot more complicated than that simple comparison. But but the yep. reason I, I raise that is I mean, were you aware since you live in you know that general part of the globe, yep. you are in the Air Force in '61, you're in Thailand '64, '65. Yep. Did you have a, a pretty strong awareness as a young man of the threat of communism in that part of the world? I mean, especially since the British had had fought this insurgent war in Malaysia that at least superficially looked, looked something like Vietnam. Were, were, was this something you were, you were very aware of so that when they said, well, you're going to Thailand to be part of a mission to prevent communist incursions into Thailand, did that make sense to you because you, you were aware that communism was a, a significant threat there in Southeast Asia? Um reasonably aware reasonably aware now in about um uh, there was a strong well hang on yeah a reasonably strong um acknowledgement of the domino theory in australia um and we in 1953 had a major thing happened here in Australia where a, a Soviet spy um, asked for political asylum in Australia mm. and the Russians tried to um, force her, his, his wife to leave Australia and um, the aircraft had to land at Darwin for fuel and um, the Australian, I'm not quite sure federal police were going at that time, but Australian police entered the aircraft and escorted Mrs. Petrov off the aircraft. And, and, and so the Russian, Russians didn't, um, uh, couldn't, um, couldn't take her out of Australia. So, um, so we were aware of the... Um, I'll use the term supposed communist threat to Australia. Mm. Now, um, now, how how much that threat was real? Well, I don't know, but it was certainly perceived, um, yeah. especially by my parents in that, as being very real. Now, here in the states, you know the the conflict in Malaysia, where you have sort of a, a communist or communistic uprising against the British in Malaysia. Yes. Yep. Um, that's, I think that's not known by, by very many people here in the States. Yep. Um, but um, to what extent were you aware of that, that there had been this communist or communistic insurgency in Malaysia, that the British with, with Australia and with New Zealand forces and others from you know, um, from the, the British Empire that they had successfully put this insurgency down in Malaysia. To what extent were you aware of that as a, as a young person? Reasonably aware. Um, I won't say very aware. Um, reasonably aware because there were articles in the paper about it, about what our, our Air Force and what the RWF was doing and what the army was doing, because the army was over there as well um, um, with them um, and reasonably aware of what was happening. If there was a, um, a major um, battle or a major win or whatever what way you want to put it, um, major incident, let's use that term, uh, uh, um, uh, an incident, a major incident, um, then it was reported in the press both on the radio and in the papers. Um, so there was an awareness um, of, of the situation. Of course, when I joined the Air Force, the, the awareness was more heightened because of um, the reports within the RAF that, that um, were done. 
within the Royal Australian Air Force. Yes. So, so just yes. one last question related to Malaysia, and then we'll go back to Thailand. Yep. So then, I mean, and I understand we're talking about decades ago. Yes. But so far as you can remember, was there, did you make a connection in your mind between, you know, the British, the Australians, the New Zealanders, I imagine others with, with British forces, putting down this communist inspired insurgency in Malaysia, there's a connection between what happened in Malaysia and what is happening now elsewhere in Southeast Asia with possible communist incursions coming into Thailand. Conceptually, did, it, did these things seem like they were part of the same general story that was playing out in the world at the time? That's pretty hard for me to answer. Yeah. Um... I'm not quite sure whether I made that connection, but it certainly is possible um, that I had a general understanding of um, what appeared to be flow on, um, that the, the, the communists um, wanted to move through Asia and then eventually get to Australia. Now that's the that's that's now whether that's a a post time um, thought um, or whether it was at the time thought, I, I don't know. I can't remember. But, um, but so. you you do remember people, for example, here in the in the States, I mean um, President Lyndon Johnson memorably said, and this is very early, I think it's 60, 64, early 64, I, he was recorded as saying, we need to fight the communists there so that we don't have to fight them in our kitchens here. And, you know, you think about that, well, I mean, how exactly are the Viet Cong going to get across the Pacific Ocean <laughs> and attack you in your kitchen? It, it seems a little yeah. implausible, and I don't think he meant to be taken yeah. that, that literally. Yeah. But, yeah. but Australia is in the general neighborhood. Yes. yes. Um, and, yeah. was, and it sounds like you're saying there was that sense that, you know, we really do need to stop the communists in Malaysia. We need to stop them in, from getting into Thailand. We need to yep. help to put it down in Vietnam. Because yep. we are actually closer than the yep. U.S. to this problem. Yep. And, and if we don't stop them, then they may just make their way to northern Australia and work their way down. Do you, you do remember people talking that way? Um, certainly, um, certainly, um, certainly my, I can, I can um, um, recall my dad talking about that. Um, he... Um, he... He did make statements like we've got to keep those Chinese out of, out of Australia. You know, um, don't know whether he was Chinese general or Chinese red. I'm not quite mm -hmm. sure. Um, right. But he said, because um, um, that's, that's going to happen if we don't, if we don't do something about it. Well, um, and certainly, I mean, China had become communist not too long before. So that's, that's correct. In 1948. Yes. Yep. Let's 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 return to Thailand. You're a young Australian. Um, yep. What are your what are your? I'm interested in just hearing some of your memories of this radically different society. Now I understand that when you're with Australians, you're sort of in an Australian bubble, and then I imagine you rub shoulders with the Americans. Differences, but a lot of similarities as well. Yes. But then sometimes you really are in the in this very very different society. What was so far as you remember? What was your very first impression? of Thailand when the, the door on the plane opens and you take in that air for the first time, you set sight on something in Thailand for the first time. Do, do you recall what your first impression was? No, I don't, um, but I'll go back a step on my way to Thailand. I went from, from Sydney to Perth by Qantas, um, which is the Australian airline, then from Perth up to Singapore, up, up to um, Paya Liba Airport. Now, we arrived at Paya Liba Airport at about um, 11 o'clock at night. Um, yeah, somewhere about there. And um, walked up the back, 
to the open door to the ramp going to the stairs going down to the to the um, to the um, tarmac and walk, walked out the door and whack the humidity and the smells um, were almost overwhelming. Um, and, this is Singapore, and, you're saying? At Singapore, yes. Yeah. And immediately sweat popped out of his skin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we walked down the stairs and um, we walked uh, to a semi-trailer bus um, that you had to stand up where all the passengers and they loaded all the passengers and all the baggage onto this semi-trailer bus that then took you to the airport, uh, to the airport building. So I don't know how far we were from the airport building, but yeah. that's what they did. And that's the thing. But when I arrived at Thailand, um, we went up in from, from um, Butterworth, um, which is a RAF base, to Ubon. We went up by the um, C-130A aircraft. aircraft. Um, we went up on a Wednesday, arrived up in Thailand about midday. And um, and uh, a a truck was waiting for us, and we had to we had we had our baggage on uh, with us. And we had to carry our own baggage in, and a truck was and, and and I suppose it was and it was a bit cooler than Singapore, um, and I suppose it was. Um, this is anticipation, um, not proper memory. Wow! So this is Thailand. Just look at that. Wow. You know, being, being a, as, I, as I said, I'm one of the, I've got in front of them, a green, naive, 20 year old country kid um, going out of Australia. This was amazing. Fancy this. Wonder what adventures I can get up to here. <laughs> so that was, that was, that's, that's imagination. Whether it was truth, I can't answer that. But it's certainly, um wonderment i suppose that would have been the the um biggest thing to describe wonderment hmm. of, of being in in in, a, in another country of another culture what we did do on a number of occasions is practice rescues from um of a saber pilot out of the saber um, um, the, the 79 squadron had a safety officer, um, and, um, he would uh, then, um, not tell anybody, but he would contact the tower and say, um, I want to practice rescue on, um, Sabre number such and such when he comes back from his, from the flight. And he'd arrive back at about half past 11 and, uh, and he would then taxi over to the, um, to the tarmac oftentimes in front of the tower. And then the, um, when you saw that, you knew something was going on. And then the tower would call us practice rescue and we'd have to turn out and go and pull the pilot out of the, out of the aircraft. You're there pretty early. Um, yes. So things will, of course, you know, heat up quite a bit as, as the years go on into the early seventies. Yep, um, sure. what, what kinds of um, incidents did the planes on your base have that that you recall related okay. to the mission of defending okay. Thailand. Okay. Now, um, we we had no we had some minor instant incidences of no radio, which is neither here nor there. Um, and we had some I can't remember what other smaller malfunctions there might have been, but. Um, while I was there, um, there were three, um, one major inc incident I attended and two incidents that I didn't um, because I was off duty on the day. The major incident was a um, Royal Thai Air Force um, C-47 um, coming back from um, um, uh, parachute training at another airport. Now that happened on 3rd of September, 1964. Uh, and it crashed um, about two or three K out to the um, south end of the main runway. And there were 27 people killed in it. Wow. Uh, and um, it um, crashed at about um, just 
just after just after dusk. So it'll be about quarter past seven. Um, and we heard the Americans' sirens going. Um, and next thing, the American fire truck went past the front of the picture theatre. And we thought, what's going on here? And then we um, we then um, then got the call, all fireys to the to the um, uh, to the uh, communication centre. So we all turned up the communication centre, and we were told there's an aircraft crash out to the out to the um, south of the runway. Um, don't know where it is, somewhere out there. And so we um, all the the crew for the night jumped on the on the fire trucks. Um, and by this time it was very dark and we drove down the, down the runway to the end of the runway and we couldn't see any glow or fire. Um, and uh, we stopped at the end of the runway and there was a Jeep off to the left um, of us. And um, um, that was the officer of day's Jeep. And then next thing out of the swamp um, came, which was a, uh, not a swamp, but a, but a quite a wet area um, out to the uh, side of the runway, the, uh, um, an American Air Force Corporal firefighter came out of the out of the swamp, and he said, "Man, you'll never go through there, you know, and um, you you won't you won't do go through there." And so there was a bit of heated discussion going on between the the flight sergeant and the sergeant. <clears throat> now why, why why was he saying you'll never go through there oh because of the swampy area oh i see okay yeah. okay all the swampy area right and, the, and that's right you wouldn't be able to go drive straight off the end of the runway out towards where it was now <clears throat> so the, there was major discussion going on between the ncos um what are we going to do and all that sort of stuff and um a mate of mine who had been there six had already been there six months or more and he was a bit of a a bit of a character, black name Roger Quick, um, but he he was he had been around the area and had driven around apparently, and he he, he said stuff you guys, um, um, I'm going to take the off the orderly officer's jeep and see if I can find this damn thing, and because I was a mate of Roger, he said Greg you up on the back and you stand up in the back see if you could see it, so we just you know without orders basically we hopped in the orderly officer's jeep. And um, he, Roger was driving, and I was I was sta uh, standing in the back, um, and because they had a, had a had a cover over the back, I, um, I was uh, just sitting down on the tailgate to initially and hanging onto the canvas uh, over the back. And we went around the airport on this very sandy track, um, and um, I'm not quite sure the direction of it. But anyway, going along, and eventually I, he said, okay, Greg, stand up on the back, see if you can see anything. So I stood on the tailgate and hanging on the back, and we were moving along this track, and next thing I saw a faint glow over to the left. And so um, just up from there, there was a track off to the left, so Roger turned off to the left, went on there, and we arrived just after the, um, the USAF people had arrived because they hadn't even got to work by the time we arrived. Um, they hadn't even started operations by the time we had arrived. And here's this, here's this aircraft. Um, the the fusel fuselage broken up off behind the wing, and it was upside down, um, uh, facing us, uh, uh, facing the airport, and the rest of it um, over under bamboo. You know, there's all bamboo clumps around and all that sort of stuff. And so... Um, the, the sergeant in charge of the USAF sa said to us, look, okay, you two guys, go around the back of the, of the, of the tail area and see what um, what's, see if anything's around there. So we took, took a couple of torches, went around the back, and it was, you know, couldn't see that well. And uh, next thing I tripped over something and, and then fell against a well wall and sort of Roger grabbed me to stop me falling in. Um, and and we, he pulled me back out and and looked at what we'd uh, what what I had tripped over, and it was it was a casualty, but it was a village casualty that had been killed by debris from the aircraft, and I'd actually tripped over him and almost fell down the well, and so um, we went back and reported to the um, 
to the sergeant and Roger said, look, I'll go back and bring our crew. And so Roger, I stayed there with the, um, the USAF crew and do, doing firefighting. And um, Roger went back and he came back with the crew in a different direction um, about 20 minutes later. And so we were there until three o'clock in the morning and um, um, we put the fire out. Um, the RAF sent an ambulance and a, and a, and a flatbed track uh, truck to the to the scene, um, mm. and then so we then start then the Thai Air Force people arrived, um, and um, by in the meantime we'd done some searching, and we'd found where uh, where the where the casualties were, but but we didn't touch them. Um, the Thai Air Force people came in, and then they just went in there and just just grabbed them and just threw them up onto the truck. Um, and it, um, it was an absolute shock to me the way they were handled, um, as if it was just, just a nothingness, you know, it was just onto the truck. Um, and so, but the, the amazing thing about that crash is that seven people got out of alive. So, um, I yes, they were injured, but they got out of it alive. Now, I'm not quite sure how that, where they were, because I didn't see any live people you know, injured people. So I've no idea where they got to anything. But how it came to happen was they were coming back and um, um, the co-pilot was flying it, but he hadn't had much nighttime experience. Oh. And he, um, he was flying a bit low and his uh, poor, uh, starboard wing hit a tree and that tossed him straight into, he just flung him around, tossed him straight into the ground and the, as I say, the fuselage broke off behind the wing. It rolled, and of course, in, in hidden ground, it sort of went like that in, in a sweeping motion and threw all the, all the passengers underneath the bamboo, and underneath the bamboo club, and the, and the fire ended up on top of them. So they, hadn't, they didn't have a hope. Well, you're talking about it's an accident, but yes. you know, it's part of this growing, you know, that, that plane is, doing training because there's this growing problem in Southeast Asia. And of course, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia to the east of Thailand are gonna be the, the major parts mm -hmm. of that unfolding story. And sometimes what you hear Americans say when they served in Vietnam was that there was a certain, and I'm not saying that this is true, I'm just reporting you know, what, what, you, what you hear, that there's a certain callousness about life that you know you could kind of pick up on in in Vietnam. Um, is when you saw what you saw when the bodies were sort of being stacked up unceremoniously. Did was that the kind of thought that went through your mind that there was a certain callousness here that was kind of behind that. Um. Probably. Um, you see, we as Westerners, especially around that time, around, you know, around, around, around you know, mid, the mid 20th century, we didn't, as kids, we didn't have much to do with death. Mm. Um, now, up to that time, I personally didn't go, hadn't been to any funerals. Um, my mum and dad had been to a couple, you know, I don't know how many, but I would say a couple. But as far as death was concerned and treatment of the um, of the dead. I didn't have the foggiest idea, but I just thought the the being being in a um, in a Christian society, the dead are held in respect. Um, from you just you just think about it, you know, you, as sure. as, a, as a, in a Christian society, sure, um, the dead are held in respect. Um, 
but what I saw there was no respect. Mm. Um, and yes, there was um, sadness, as I found out a couple of days later, because it happened, because there were friends involved in the accident, but the handling of the dead, there was no respect by the people doing it. Right? And they were just, um, they were just non, uh, the non-commissioned officers. They were just the airmen uh, from the Royal Thai Air Force. Now, I don't know what, 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 what areas they worked in. I have no idea, but they were just there. And they just went in there. They didn't even have gloves on. They just went in there, grabbed them, and if necessary, put them on a, I can't even remember whether they did put them on stretches, whether they just picked them up. I can't remember. But it, it was not good, you know, from, from a Western perspective. Yeah, that's that's the best way I could describe it. Sure. Okay. What well, what impact did it, did it have on you? Did it was it just disconcerting? Did it anger you? Um, did you know? I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't know what to think. Um, um, looking back on it, no, I, I I don't know how I felt. You know what? But that was the stressor for my PTSD. That that I that came evident many 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 years later, um, but that was the initial stressor, um, where um, and as as is as is framed that, um, and the way I I put it is that is that yes I have no control over this, but as a fiery, I I've got to have a control. But I, I'm out of control here. I have no control over this. And so there's a inner conflict in your mind um, that you, you push down uh, because it's, it's that far out of the realms of normalcy that you don't want to think about it. Instead, of, like these days, I say, deal with it within 48 hours and it does not have a harmful effect. But if, you, if it is pushed down, like... like we did in those days, if you push it down and don't get it out, then it comes back years later and bites you on the bum. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So that, that was the, that was, you know, I, there's, there was certainly in amongst the fireys um, um, the next day um, when we went to work, because we finished up at the scene at about three o'clock in the morning. That's when we left. And we went back to work, we went home, uh, had a shower, um, scrubbed our skin as much as we could, but we could smell, still smell the smell uh, of the incident on, our, on, our, on, our, on, on my skin, even though I'd scrubbed myself in the middle of the night. Mm. Um, I could still, still smell it. And went back to, went to work that morning at, at eight o'clock. And there was um, a very subdued, atmosphere in the fire station that that day and for at least a week after you know very subdued remember you asked me way back um about um um when i arrived in thailand and what was my first thoughts sure um uh here's a, it's uh, it's not so much exactly uh, when i arrived but it was soon after um um i um we went across to the camp had lunch and after lunch you did what we call the induction in other words they tell you what the expectation of uh, they are that is of you um as an australian oh, right. in in thailand right okay um and so they tell you okay the, uh and the the commanding officer he give you um a, a, a talk on why you were there um the Padre then um, talked about um, 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 the hazards of sexual contact 
um, which the the the, 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 doys, uh, the girls of the night um, in in town, right. um, and general other things about don't eat the food, don't drink the water, all this sort of stuff, you know. Right. But, but um, um, I drank the food. I not I don't. I ate the food. I drank the water. Um, um, I drank the the um, the rice whiskey. Um, not that much of it, but I did, um, and that sort of thing. But anyhow, afterwards, um, the, the the blokes have been there for a while. They're, they're talking about they talk about it in a, in a different sort of sense. But the first word that I that I learned of Thai was yut. Now, yut means stop. So mm. now, and they say if you hear if you're in town. And you hear yut and you can't mis mistake it. It's yut, you yut. Because if you don't, you could well be shot. Because wow. um, the, um, the, the police over there had no hesitation, yelling yut, pulling out the pistol and bang. So, wow. if, you, you be so if you hear yut, you make sure you yut. So mm. That was the... Um, that was the the an interesting immediate concept of of um, of um, um, what it was like in Thailand, and I'll just carry on a little bit there, if you don't mind, um, about early experiences. Um, I'm not quite sure whether it was on that day or whether it was on the first weekend. It might have been before that, and they, the, the bloke said, "I'll take you to town." So the way we went to town. And um, um, and as I said, I was a green, naive country kid, mate. Um, if I'd been any greener, sap would have been pouring out of my skin. <laughs> um, went into town and we went to the Australia Club. Now, I didn't know what the Australia Club was. Yeah. Um, and anyhow, there's some Aussies in there. And... Anyhow, it was, I found out later it was a brothel. And um, here's some ladies sitting on the laps of some Australian guys. And next thing, one of the blokes went for a grope. And I tell you what, mate, I was that embarrassed. I didn't know where to look. And I just wanted, and I just wanted out of there. <laughs> and, and, mate, I just went outside and just, but you've got to be joking. What, what have I let myself in for? You know? right, <laughs> so that's, yeah. you know, for, from, a, from a young kids, well, I was 20, but for never had been exposed to anything like that in my life. Right. That was, that was an, an, an eye opener to what, how, to use an Australian term, the other half lived. When yeah. you were out, uh, in you know in the thai community so you're off yes. base you're on leave yes. did you feel safe I mean, did you feel like absolutely you feel absolutely okay. um at no time did i ever feel threatened never did i feel threatened there was once that we were confined to base in november sometime um for a couple of nights uh, because there were some meetings in town that it was considered that it was not wise for um, um, Farangs to be um, present. Farangs, big word for foreigner, yeah. Foreigner. Yeah, right. yep. Um, yeah. If someone asked the Thai, let's say on the other, you know, you're bargaining for a watch, you're bargaining for a ring. Yeah. Um, suppose somebody asked the Thai person with whom you're bar bargaining, um, you know why are the why are the Australians here? I mean, what are they doing in Thailand? Do and again, I know we're talking about something decades ago, and I I don't know if you ever had this conversation with Thai, but I mean, I, I'm interested in what your perception was of their perception of you. Did they see you just as an economic opportunity? Did they have any sense that these folks are here to protect us from the communists? I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm pretty confident a 20 year old probably isn't having these conversations with locals, but did you pick up any sense of that, of their okay. perception of you?
the appearance uh, uh, from what are you know uh, appearance and this is going back 60 years generally speaking there was an acceptance of us all right um there there didn't seem to be any hostility no um, i didn't pick up any hostility um you know you'd go into a shop and um and you'd and you'd be looking around and 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 most of them could speak basic english not everyone but most uh, lots of people can could um we could well i learned um get by tie um enough to get by um 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 so no when no there's some photos of, of going out on a walk um with another mate of mine jeff jeff um jeff hoy and um we went out to the east we just went one day we were off duty and we just went walking out east um and every um every tie we passed um there was a the greeting of sawadi um, or Sawadee Cup, um, and um, um, we went, we found a school that the Australian Construction Squadron had built way back in 62, and they welcomed, welcomed us with, uh, they were overjoyed that we had come out, come there, even though it was an offhand visit. Um, <clears throat> and um, they were just explaining everything that the Australians had done. Um, <clears throat> now, as far as um, 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 that thing that you intimated there with your question, when you're at with the with the ties now, I associated with the ties a fair amount, um, but I can't say that was for everyone. Now Roger Quick, he had been there six months before, and somehow or other, he um, he got to know the Thai officers really well, including the the commanding officer of the Thai base, the Colonel Narong. Uh, don't ask me how he did it, but he did. And I'd no sooner be there. And he went, he took me down to the, the, the Thai camp and introduced me to the, to, the, the, to the Colonel and to the Thai officers. And I went down to the Thai, Thai base um, and ate meals at the, the, at the Thai officers camp, played snooker, went flying with the, with the Thais in the helicopter. And as there's some photos there about that, I went flying into T28 on a, on a patrol, um, and my, I flew the plane for the most of the patrol, um, and that sort of thing. You see, so but they they were pleased that we were there, um, you know, because we had a um, had some conversations um, uh, about different things, and and my understanding is that they were happy that the Australian, and like they said, we're happy that you're here for us. That sort of thing, you know. And it's that's uh, and, and your perception was that wasn't only because Australians brought money with them that they put into the Thai county, but the Australians were there to help with defense yes. in case of yes, yes. Incursions. especially the military, per, the air force personnel. Yeah, except except for one time, there was four Australians, um, mostly um, non. Uh, we were junior non-commissioned officers, airmen. Um, the highest rank was corporal. Um, and we were invited to the Thai um, officers' mess for a dining-in night. Okay? Um, and we were on um, one of the wings. And so we were on the second wing. The head table was here um, in front of us and four wings off. And we were, we were on the second wing of, of the, to the to the right of the commanding officer the commanding officer sat in the middle of the head table and we're eating away and uh, and there was and having conversation with our Thai friends around us and next thing behind us in the table behind us um there was a bit of a ruckus and a bloke jumped up and uh, or he, he well I, i'll use that term but he, he stood up and he started getting quite um vocal in Thai. Now, I didn't have the foggiest idea what he was saying, but the room went quiet. 
and um, um, I lent over to to Bunsum, my, my uh, a friend of mine, over to uh, over to the right, a Thai Air Force pilot, lieutenant. I said, "What's going on?" He said, and he said, it "Doesn't matter. It's okay. You know, it doesn't matter. It's okay." Um, and um, the the colonel stood up and he he waved his fist and and my, and the bloke shut up and he sat down and um, and I said again, "What's that about?" He said, and Bunsum said, "That's okay. That's okay." And um, he um, in about ten minutes later he got up again and oh mate, it was it was more fierce the uh, and more raucous than the previous one mm. and. Um, and I said, there must be something wrong. And the Bunsen, he was getting a bit agitated. He said, no, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> and uh, the colonel jumped up again and, and uh, started shouting at him. And this bloke shouted back at him. And the, the, um, the colonel pulled out his 45, you know, out of his holster. And I thought, he's going to shoot him. <laughs> And he, he, he was waving his pistol around, his, his colt around, uh, and he walked around the tables and, and they were shouting and he was waving his, his, his pistol around. And next thing he went, whack, 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 around the head with his pistol. And the, and the bloke dropped to the ground and he, and, he, and he put his pistol away and looked at us and said, sorry. And uh, two blokes got this bloke, uh, two other fellows got this bloke up, picked him up and took him out. And the colonel sat down mm. and mate i i tell you what that was <laughs> i thought he was gonna i thought here's one wed one dead guy coming up you know so and what and was apparently the issue? What, what 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 the issue was he was questioning our right to be at the dining in night oh i see so he felt that the australians were crashing the thai party he was crashing that we were crashing the party but we were there at the invite of the colonel i see uh, oh yeah and loss of face mate loss of face here in the united states the vietnam war in a sense is still very much alive yep um the divisions that exist in this country i think i think in some ways can be traced to the divisions of the of the vietnam war um, among veterans of that era, there still is a, a fair amount of bitterness um, about the war, about how veterans feel they were treated when they, when they came home. Now, I know that from the perspective of the, the Australian government, you're not technically a Vietnam vet because of when you were in Thailand. But certainly when we step back, we yes. see that you were certainly part of this unfolding story in Southeast Asia. Um, and so in my mind, I certainly link you to that, that whole campaign that involves Southeast Asia and you're there in Thailand. I'm just asking for your own perception, your own perspective. Where is the Vietnam War in Australian public culture today? I don't think there's much angst about it now. Maybe about people my age, um, and that there could be still, but I can't answer that. Um, but generally speaking, I don't think it's a divisive thing in Australia. I could well be wrong, but I don't think so. Um, Wasn't it when, when you return home in 65 and then the following year, 66, 67, 68, do you remember it as a divisive thing at that time? Um, oh, yes. Oh, later on. Oh, absolutely. Um, um, it didn't affect me in, 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 in a, in a I, just, I just, I was angry about, the, about what was going on, about the marches, about the, um, um, and, um, that sort of and you know and the and the and the, and the draft dodgers and and i was annoyed not so much angry but really annoyed that 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 was the case here we are we're trying to protect you lot and you're saying you know we're murderers and child killers and all that sort of stuff mm. you know that you're you, 
that is unacceptable. That is not right. So that's the sort of feeling I have.